Good morning, everyone. I'm Doreen, and I will be the MC for today's session. The world is full of diamonds and gems, and we are having some of them here today. With this note, I would like to give my heartiest welcome to our resource person, Dr. M. L. Munjar, AICTE Distinguished Chair Professor, an Indian Acoustical Engineer, Honorary Professor, and INSA Senior Scientist at the Facility for Research in Technical Acoustics of the Indian Institute of Science. Our principal, Dr. P. Devasundari, our faculties, and to all our blooming students, welcome all. A man cannot be comfortable without his own approval, says Mark Twain, a famous American writer. Self-confidence, the key to success, or we can say the first step to success. If a person has self-confidence, he has won half the battle. Self-confident people seem at ease with themselves and their work. They invest trust and inspire confidence in others. These are all attractive characteristics one must have. I would like to invite Dr. Edward Kennedy, head of the Mechanical Engineering Department, to deliver the welcome speech. Very good morning to all of and it is really a great pleasure to have a session like this, and the two with the distinguished professor, Dr. M. L. Munjol. Sir, on behalf of the KCG College of Technology, we welcome you for this session, sir. We are very grateful to you for accepting our invitation and be present for this and to share your experience with our, with our students and also the students from other organizations and institutions. We welcome you, sir. And also, I welcome all the participants for this program with a, with a special interest towards the topic. I hope all of you would have joined for this one. The topic itself says developing a self-confidence is a challenge. It's not going to come very naturally. We all know that. So it has to be built brick by brick. And uh, it's a wonderful session. It is going to be a wonderful session for all of us to listen for this from the to listen on this topic from the distinguished professor. So stay with us. Thank you all for joining for this one. Thank you once once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those warm words of welcome. Standing by our founder and chairman, Dr. KCG Varghese's vision to make every man a success and no man a failure, KCG College of Technology is committed in the holistic development of every student nurturing the attributes of service and ethical value system in technical education, thereby producing responsible citizens and progressive leaders. The Department of Research in association with AICTE has come up with a challenge yourself for developing self-confidence to nurture students with indispensable thoughts. May I now invite Dr. Deepa Jose Head Research and Associate Professor of Electronics and Communication Department to introduce the speaker of the day. Thank you, Doreen. I'm proud and privileged to introduce the speaker for today, Dr. Emil Munjal, Professor IIC Bangalore and uh, INSA Honorary Scientist. So has completed his PhD and Masters from Indian Institute of Science. So has published more than 213 journal papers and 145 conference papers, three books and two patents. Saur so has 7,943 citations to his publications and H index is 38 and ITIN index is 98. So has been the former chairman of the National Committee for Noise Pollution Control, president of Acoustic Society of India and Board of Directors of the International Institute of Acoustics and Vibration, Vice President of Indian National Science Academy, Member of Board of Research of AICT, and Member of Advisory Board of CSIR and DST, and many more. Sir is a recipient of many honors and awards. 
Sir is a recipient of Jawaharlal Nehru National Award in Engineering and Technology for the year 2010 for significant contribution to noise pollution control. Sir is also a recipient of the DRDO Academic Excellence Award 2009 at the hands of former Honorable Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Sir C. V. Raman Award for the year 2007. Shanti Swarup Padnagar Awards received at the hands of former Honorable Prime Minister of India, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, and the Science Academy Medal for Young Scientist Award by the Indian National Science Academy received at the hands of Honorable Prime Minister of India, Ms. Indra Gandhi. So we are in, in fact uh, lucky and privileged uh, to have such a renowned person amongst us. Uh, I welcome you once again on behalf of KCG College of Technology and on behalf of the students who will be keenly awaiting for your lecture and over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Deepa. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and I must thank Dr. Kennedy and also your principal. A very, very nice uh, introduction, etc. It's really a pleasure uh, talking to you and more than anything to your students. Uh, who are just at the right age, you know, to be influenced positively towards this approach. And I'm going to tell you something which is all from personal experience and everything tried uh, on myself. And therefore, you know, you will know that whatever I'm saying, it's from my deep heart. And I really will be very happy if some of you can absorb and, you know, uh, what I use it in your life really take you a little higher. Yeah, I just want to tell you that I was born to parents with no formal education. And on the wrong side of the border in 1947 and starting my life from a refugee camp, I rose to receive awards from three different prime ministers. So I just want to share with you my a brief life story with the hope that it will inspire the younger generation to challenge themselves at every stage and convert adversity into advantage. Instead of cribbing about inadequacy of resources, facilities, and opportunities. Now, I was uh, three year old uh, in 1947 when, uh, you know, we had to leave everything uh, on the wrong other, other side of Punjab, which is now Pakistan, and uh, settled down, you know, Sharpur, you know, in Punjab, uh, in a refugee camp. Now, it, in, you can imagine what the life would be in a refugee camp. Uh, everybody was uh, crying most of the time, and, uh, you know, uh, praying to God to, you know, get out of that uh, somehow. Not only that, there were many of us, uh, you know, who had been separated. In fact, my father, you know, took three months to trace my mother and me. So that, that's how people got separated from each other. So what I'm trying to say is that in that kind of stage, uh, my father could only thank God all the time. And I was very surprised as a three-year-old child, I asked him, you know, what he was thanking for, you know, and everybody else was crying and praying for something. And she, he was only thanking God. He said something which has remained with me all my life. He said, son, we are alive. Isn't that, isn't that sufficient? He said, God gave us life and rest is in our own hands. No excuses. So this ultimate bottom line has stayed with me all my life. And I thought I, I must share with you this part because most of us get carried, I mean, disturbed by small, small things in life during the day. But here was my father who had lost everything we had back there. He was not educated, okay? And despite all that, he was only thanking God that it was enough that we were alive. In fact, I understood this many years later when I grew up that, uh, you know, in the train that we came from Pakistan, 50% died on the way because it was 72-hour journey with all windows, doors closed, no water, nothing at all. 
So people died of, you know, just dehydration. Anyway, that, that the part, what I want to tell you is that this is what I, I call the ultimate bottom line. And we should not, you know, ask for or expect anything from God. It's enough that he, we are alive and rest is in our hands. Now, I, I joined uh, Sanatan Dharam uh, Higher Secondary School, which was about five kilometers of walking distance from the refugee camp. And, uh, you know, we had a, a tradition of uh, prayer. You know, at the, in the morning when we got together, there would be a prayer. And after the prayer, uh, once in a while, we would have a guest speaker uh, who would talk to us uh, about something that is of interest to us children. Now, on a particular day, uh, you know, this, this speaker, I think he was either a psychologist or a educationist, and he made a very nice statement. He said, nobody is born intelligent. What he said was that as we do exercise, physical exercise to build up our muscles. Same way, we should all the time challenge ourselves. And that's the best exercise for brain. And more you challenge yourself, the more brain development will take place, more creative you will become, more, you know, I mean, so successful you will be. You know, so this was a very nice thing that happened because suddenly I got something, it really touched my heart that to be intelligent is in my hand. Now I started challenging myself intellectually. Uh, playing with integers, I developed magic tables to entertain myself as well as my classmates. Now, having no entertainment at home, I engaged myself with mathematical challenges that made me excel, not only in mathematics, but also everything logical. Looking for logical patterns in algebraic calculations became my hobby, as well as a personal challenge. This is how I developed during my eighth standard what I later came to know was called the binomial theorem. Now, something very interesting happened. Uh, at the end of seventh uh, standard, I mean, those exams, uh, we had uh, some, uh, you know, vacation kind. I mean, it was called by, uh, holidays, okay? And uh, during that time, I, I used to be very fond of playing cricket. So I was playing cricket in the street and my elder brother came and si simply snatched me away from my friends and then told that you know, we cannot afford to be playing cricket or playing at all. You know, we have to arise and we have nothing at home, home anything at all. And we, you know, must be used, utilizing every moment. And he, he particularly said that, you know, the, you know I, I must excel in my cl class. He said, I have been excelling all last seven years. I have been standing first in the school. What else uh, did he want from me? And he said, no, that's not sufficient. You know, eighth standard, you know, those days eighth standard was also a board examination. So he said, you don't know what you are going in for and you have to really uh, start studying right now. Anyway, uh, just to, you know, uh, get my brother off my back, you know, won't let me play cricket you know, I discovered my potential. You know what, what happened? I, I took his eighth standard uh, mathematics book and read chapter by chapter and solved all the exercises or problems. And in about 10 days time, you know, I went back to my brother and presented to him complete uh, notebook containing all the answers to all the problems of that book. And then I said, well, like a typical child, I said, can I go and play now? Okay, so this is, <laughs> I just wanted to share this one, that, uh, you know, that is how he got convinced that, you know, okay, I was all right. But, but in the whole process, 
by that, that evening, uh, you know, I started thinking that really I could do it. I mean, I, I had discovered myself, you know, it, I just discovered my potential. It gave tremendous boost to my self-confidence and self-esteem. And in fact, that is how I chose the title of today's talk, that you challenge yourself for, uh, you know, developing self-confidence. Now, continuing further, uh, during the higher secondary, you know, it was the three years after higher secondary, 9th, 10th, and 11th. <coughs> I secured fifth rank in the Punjab University in my higher secondary examination. And this was despite the fact that I was representing my school in cricket. So we used to play in the evening cricket and at the same time, studying. And because of the confidence that I developed myself, I didn't have to study, you know, I mean, every day, I mean, everything in, in that detail. I, because all the time I would challenge myself and be able to do myself rather than studying what is written there. Another thing I want to tell you that this was a big thing because, uh, you know, Punjab University was the only university in the whole of Punjab. And in fact, those days, Punjab was also containing Haryana and Himachal Pradesh. So three states, only one university. So it, it was quite a, a distinction to get the fifth rank. In fact, I was uh, uh, taken around the city, you know, in a procession. You know, that, that is uh, what happened. Anyway, uh, despite the rank in the university, my future appeared to be bleak. My father could not afford to send me to college, leave aside an engineering college. Now, fortunately, however, the government introduced that very year, the Government of India Scholarship for Life scheme for the first 10 rank holders of every university in the country. Okay, so thus my higher education was ensured all the way to PhD at one go. Okay. And that's why I have titled this slide as God helps those who help themselves. Now, I did my pre engineering from Punjab, uh, sorry, Government College of Sharpur, which was earlier Punjab University College, before the university shifted to Chandigarh. Okay, I, I joined this Punjab Engineering College, Chandigarh, in mechanical engineering. And it had a very nice tradition. That college was a residential college, a very, very old college. In fact, uh, it used to be at Lahore before 1947. And then later on, it was shifted to Rurki and then to Chandigarh when the new city was built. Now, at the end of second year, all the students would go to Calcutta site, that is uh, East uh, India, for 20 days to look at all the industries. Similarly, uh, next year, after third year, you know, people uh, will be sent to all the way to south by coming to Bangalore and Mysore and Chennai, etc. Now, during this educational tour, the, the winter vacation, we visited Bangalore. Now, what happened was that we had brought a bogey. Uh, you know, we were all on a, a three-tier uh, bogey, which was broad gauge. In those days, there was no broad gauge connection between Bangalore and Mysore. So we had to leave our bogey at the station and catch buses to go to Mysore. But due to some common miscommunication, I missed the bus to Mysore and was stranded at Bangalore for two days. Now, that is the best thing that happened to me for I discovered the Indian Institute of Science probably the best place for a born researcher like me. So what I want to tell you is that uh, it was during those two days uh, that I, you know, stayed at IISC. In fact, you would be surprised and shocked. I did not, did not even know anything about industrial science. My general knowledge was so poor that, you know, I mean, it was really a discovery for me that here was an institute which had the best of uh, resources in the country. And more than anything, it had a very good laboratories, a very good library, and very good tradition uh, of research uh, in, in that uh, place. 
So I really told myself that, that is the place where I must be working or you know, researching. Uh, the next year, fortunately, I was selected at Indian Institute of Science to do my master's degree in the Department of Internal Combustion Engineering uh, without any test or interview. In fact, in those days, there, was no, there were no competitive examinations. The, uh, the department would look at our uh, full career, right, from matriculation upwards and see whether the person has excelled himself all the time. And if he has, we were selected. And that is how I was selected. Now, I joined the Department of Internal Combustion Engineering. Uh, for, this was a two-year program, four semesters. In fact, it was a very rigorous program because first three semesters, we studied 23 subjects and there was no choice at all. Okay, and not only that, even in every, every uh, course examination, there, were no, there was no choice in the questions. All combustion questions are compulsory and 55% was pass marks. And if a person failed in two subjects out of 23, he had to leave the institute, no appeal, nothing. He had to leave the institute and you know, the degree was denied to him. So what I'm trying to say is it was a very rigorous program. And at the end of this, you know, the final semester, uh, I was asked to work on analysis and design of mufflers uh, for the engine exhaust noise control. You know, but this was a, this was surprising because in those 23 subjects, not a single one dealt with acoustics or noise. So I knew nothing about it. You know, acoustics or noise control was not a part of the curriculum those days. So I knew nothing about the subject. Now, being a topper, I could have requested for a change in the topic for my dissertation project. However, I took it up as a personal challenge. Now, this was another uh, very special day for me because my very close friends, uh, they were really asking me that, you know, I'm, uh, was I, uh, you know, had gone mad or what? You know, uh, uh, working on a problem or what we teach you, nothing. And then I lose my rank in the uh, class. And how could I do that kind of thing? But then, you know, as I uh, told you, right from childhood, all the time I was challenging myself and I again took up the challenge. I went to the library and looked at all the journals that I could find and looked at the references. And I found that a, a book by Fundam on fundamentals of acoustics by Kinsler and Frey. That was the one book which was you know, world famous on this. And so I found out a copy of that book in the library and did the same thing that I did in eighth standard about mathematics. I gave myself a crash course in fundamentals of acoustics. Again, doing the same thing. <laughs> you know, uh, I solved again all the exercises and problems in the book all by myself. And, you know, this really uh, boosted my self-confidence much further. And more than anything, I again discovered that practically nothing had been done in this field of analysis. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so what I was trying to say is that literature survey revealed that very little had been done on rational synthesis of exhaust mufflers. And here was an opportunity for me, me to make a difference. And then sitting in the library from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., 14 hours a day except for lunch break or uh, dinner break, uh, for the next three months, making use of mathematical induction, electroacoustic analogies, and heuristics of the successive multiplication of transfer matrices, all self taught, I developed an algebraic algorithm. Now, this was a very interesting algorithm because by virtue of this novel algorithm, I was able to 
I was able to write out the algebraic expression for a velocity ratio across a given linear dynamical filter consisting of any combination of distributed or lump elements without having to solve a number of simultaneous algebraic equations. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is that normal thing is that, let us say, if you have a muffler and you look at it as a, a, a cascade of elements, uh, you know, typical filter using electrostatic analogies, and then you develop uh, and write transfer matrices and then multiply them successively one after the other. And from the overall transfer matrix, find out the transformation laws or insertion laws. Now, all this was not necessary. This algorithm allowed me to write the final insertion laws straight away from the given system. No question of writing equations, no solving simultaneously, no transfer matrix multiplication, nothing at all. Okay, that's why I said it was like binomial theorem. Okay. Now, this was a, a great thing because when I presented it uh, in the department as a seminar, everybody was simply shocked, including my own guide, whom I had never met actually after it, the problem was given. I just took it on myself. Okay. So, after I finished my seminar, uh, for two or three minutes, there was silence in the you know, uh, auditorium. And then finally, only one question was asked, how did it occur to you? Because nobody could imagine that given, I mean, this was a real breakthrough for all linear dynamical filters, whether it's electrical wave filters or vibration isolators or acoustic mufflers. You know, here was an entire new thing where I could write the answer straight away. And because I could write the answer straight away, uh, it was very useful for design because I knew that this particular element uh, has this kind of effect at the end. Or if this element, instead of preceding that, it, if it had followed that other element, it would have been better. So in this way, you know, I'm just saying here, this algebraic algorithm proved to be not only a breakthrough for analysis of one-dimensional dynamical filters, but also for a rational synthesis of vibration isolators as well as exhaust mufflers. Uh, I can just tell you that the papers that I published those days, uh, like on vibration isolators, still today remain the only paper of that kind, where for any multi-degree fit of vibration isolators, you know, I gave expressions and uh, design criteria, which you are, even now they are used. And same thing about exhaust mufflers, that, uh, you know, without having to analyze this hard way, you know, let me also tell you, uh, that it was also, it was a, also a kind of necessity. We did not have computers those days. I'm talking of 1968. Okay, our first computer came into the industrial science only in 1970. We had no computers, no question of laptops, no, no calculators, nothing at all. So there was a, a great necessity and therefore great incentive for theoretical work. And in theoretical work, this thing was completely a new breakthrough. Okay, so what I want to tell you here is, had I not challenged myself, I would have ended up by making at best a small incremental contribution to the field. Instead, I developed a niche for myself. So what happened now, uh, I mean, everybody was so impressed, all teachers, uh, you know, at that seminar, uh, that all of them, after the seminar, uh, they persuaded the head of the department to write uh, to the director. So at those days, you know, Satish Dhawan was director. So they write to him and then say that, this, uh, you know, young man now uh, needs to be absorbed as lecturer. But that was almost impossible uh, because I, I was not having PhD. You know, PhD was a must for lectureship even those days at IAS. <laughs> but consequent to a unanimous recommendation of the faculty of the department to the then director, Prestige Dhawan, I was offered a lecturership in the department without any interview. 
Okay, now this is uh, this was really a great exception that English Earth Science made for me. In fact, uh, a super memory post was created for me, giving off the requirement of PhD for the lecturer's post. Now, after finishing my master's degree, uh, I was strongly advised by my well-wishers and colleagues to apply for admission to MIT or Caltech for my PhD or IASC and sorry. Yeah, uh, IASC had no reputation in this field. But again, you know, the urge to telling myself proved too strong for me. I said, no, you know, I, I, I must do it here and prove that one doesn't necessarily have to go abroad to do PhD. So my spontaneous rejoinder was that MIT and Caltech had acquired their reputation because of the achievements of their faculty and alumni. And I would also make the best of meager resources IASC had to offer and publish papers in the best of journals. I would thus make my institute as well as research supervisors proud of me. Now, all I needed was patronage and encouragement. And I got a lot of it from Professor M. B. Narsiman, who was who has who was continue, who continued to be my friend, philosopher, and guide later. In fact, he unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Now, when I became lecturer, I uh, approached the head of the department uh, and asked for 10,000 rupees to set up this laboratory so that I could demonstrate some experiments to the uh, students. But the head of the department simply refused. He said, young man, you know, 10,000 rupees is a, is a lot of amount. You have to first prove yourself before you ask for money. Okay. So anyway, on being denied this grant of rupees 10,000 to set up experimental facilities, I challenged myself again to carry on with theoretical research. I learned and made use of the theory of combinatorics to establish sufficiency of the constraints for writing out velocity ratio in terms of valid combinations of the characteristic impedances of the elements constituting a dynamical filter, making use of an ingenious thorough array of the element subscripts. And based on the analytical validation of my algorithm, I got my PhD degree and published several papers in reputed journals. And soon thereafter, in fact, in, you know, 68, 73, I became uh, assistant professor, and soon thereafter, I was promoted as an assistant professor and was awarded the Science Academy Medal for Young Scientists for the year 1975. Uh, as uh, uh, just uh, you know, it was told uh, earlier, I received it at the hands of the then Honorable Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in January 1976 at the Science Congress in Voltaire. Uh, now, this was really a a uh, big thing for me in many ways. And one was that this is the first time I had more than a thousand rupees in my bank account. Okay. And the second thing was that this is uh, the first time my father uh, got convinced that I was on the right track. He didn't even know up to that time what I was doing and why I was doing. Okay. Because as I said, he had no formal education at all. Okay. And then once I got this award and went home and showed that photograph of Miss Indira Gandhi and me, you know, uh, that my receiving award. And then he was convinced, not that he understood all that award or anything, but he understood that I must be doing something right. Okay. So after that, he never questioned, you know, what I was doing. Now, during the next seven years, I worked on analysis of commercial mufflers, most of which make use of perforated elements. 
And this posed a formidable challenge. You know what happens is that you have uh, two or three pipes uh, interacting with each other through the holes. And therefore, the wave propagation waves in one get are interacting with the waves in the annulus and so on. So you have a number of partial differential equations to be solved simultaneously. Now, this was very, very difficult. Okay. Uh, but then, in association with one of my PhD students, Dr. K. Narayana Rao, who had come to me under quality improvement program from uh, you know, the, the college, uh, Asmania College, uh, Engineering College, you know, in Asmania University College, uh, Hyderabad. You know, we developed a distributed parameter approach along with Eigen analysis of perforated element mufflers. And a paper based on this work was a judge best paper in the world in muffler acoustics by Nelson Industries in USA. And we got the Nelson Acoustical Paper Award first prize in 1984. Now this was another thing very, very important because uh, you know, both my student and I, we were uh, invited all the way to USA with all expenses paid. And uh, then we got $2,000 each you know, as an award. More than that, uh, you know, the Nelson Industries really found that somebody was doing this work with much better in India than in USA. In fact, that was my first visit to USA. And uh, then uh, Larry Erickson, vice president, he, he tried to persuade me to stay on uh, there. And uh, I said, no, that's not right because, uh, you know, I still, uh, you know, I, mean, I said India Institute of Science needs me and I must get back. But I told, I told him that next sabbatical, whenever I get, you know, I'll try to join them for one year and that, that's all. But I, I cannot settle then you would say, no, that's not all. You know, there was, I mean, me in that, you know, the nationalism was so strong. And more than that, I wanted to prove that, you know, every, uh, uh, what should I say, promising uh, scientist doesn't have to, uh, you know, go over to USA as it used to happen those days. And based on this breakthrough, I got two projects from the Volkswagen Foundation in Germany and published a few papers that have been cited very widely. And because of all this now, a number of things happened. You know, I had my first sabbatical at the Institute for Technical Acoustics at Technical University of Berlin during 1780, where I gave a course on muffler acoustics in English. You know, what happened was I was invited by the director of that institute and uh, I, I knew some uh, German some German language, but you know, it was not sufficient at all for me to be lecturing in German. Same way, my, uh, the, my audience who were all professors, uh, they uh, knew little English, but not sufficient to understand everything in English. So I worked out via media, you know, and then I used to prepare lecture notes and hand over the rocks copies. Yeah. Uh, so I would, uh, you know, hand over the rocks copies of the same one week in advance in English. These handwritten notes incidentally became the first draft of a monograph. Thus, I once again converted a problem into an opportunity. Now, these notes eventually resulted in the monograph Acoustic Subjects and Mufflers, published by John Wiley, New York, in 1987. And mind you, this book, until today, has remained the only book in the world. So I really became a kind of pioneer in my field. And then, in fact, uh, later they approached me 19th uh, in 2013-14 uh, for the second edition. And so this second edition has been published by again John Wiley, but this time in UK, which is their headquarters, in February 2014. Now, during my sabbatical stay in West Berlin, in association with Professor Manfred Haeckel, I worked on the mechanisms of railway noise generation. So I moved away from my mufflers field 
and because I like actually what happened was Professor Hickel told me uh, that the, the grant from, uh, from which I was being paid uh, that is actually uh, dealing with railway noise. So I said, all right, I'll work on railway noise. Again, now I knew nothing about it, but I again took up the challenge. I studied the rail wheel interaction and modeled the flexural vibration of the rail as well as wheel and investigated the effect of the periodic sleepers underneath. An interesting result of the study was that the sleepers should not be placed at equal distances. Even that they are always placed at around 60 centimeter distance. So I, what I said was exact periodicity was responsible for harmonic excitation of the rail resulting in excessive noise in certain bands of frequencies and hence the train speeds. Now, after coming back, as I told you, I continued from um, working on mufflers. And then uh, in 86 uh, beginning, I, I got my full professorship in 1986. I was 41 years old at that time. But around the same time I received uh, the Shanti Suru Bhadagar Prize in Engineering Sciences for the year 1986 at the hands of Sri Rajiv Gandhi, then, then Honorable Prime Minister Gandhi and fellowship of the Indian National Science Academy in 87, fellowship of the Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore in 87, and fellowship of the then newly established Indian National Academy of Engineering in 87. In a way, I became a founder fellow of INA, although I was away at the University of Calgary in Canada uh, and Nelson Industries in Wisconsin for my second sabbatical. And then one thing I must also tell you that he must have been in very, under very special stars, as they say, because you can see here this uh, one, two, three, four, all the four things I received within two years, from 86 to 87. Now, during my stay at Nelson Industries, uh, I worked for the first time on active noise control of the air handling units used in thermal power plants and the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. Now, this is an, again a very interesting thing. When this Dr. Larry Erickson invited me and he asked me to work on active noise control, I, I asked him, I said, no, I till today, all my life, I have worked only passive systems. So what do you think I'll be able to do with active systems? It was very interesting. He says, we know that you will do it. You know, and in fact, it is uh, very uh, moving to see this uh, man in USA having more faith in me than myself at that time. So I just told myself, I'll take up the challenge and I'll not let him down. So I studied the whole field and then saw that, you know, they did not know uh, how actually active noise control system worked. They were, they were like, all electrical engineers. Uh, you know, basically electrical communication engineers, and uh, they were uh, uh, using this digital signal processing uh, with adaptation, and that is how the, they were making the system work. But they really did not know how exactly it was working because they, they, they didn't know much about acoustics. Anyway, our studies revealed that in a tuned active noise control system, the secondary source or the auxiliary source and the primary source unload each other. What I'm trying to say is they present an acoustical short circuit, that means zero acoustic impedance to each other. In this way, uh, they are made to silence each other by means of an adaptive digital infinite impulse response filter working on the feedback control of uh, or the feed forward approach. Of those days we use the feedback control, okay? So now uh, what happened was that because they knew how the system worked, all they had to do is the system had to produce a zero impedance at those junctions, okay? And in fact, I also uh, came out with optimum master function uh, that must be generated by the system. And then they'll find that, you know, they have this kind of thing where there's no noise coming from at, I mean, coming at all from the primary system as far as auxiliary system. And this is a very important thing because up to that time, we used to think that, you know, 
they had to uh, have positive energy and negative energy. But the first thing I told myself that they cannot do anything like negative energy. Okay, all uh, we had to do is we we have that transfer function and if that we used on the, the primary signal being multiplied by that before it's given to the uh, you know this uh, auxiliary system. Uh, and what would happen is the real part of the acoustic impedance would be zero at the primary source as well as auxiliary source. So both of them would silence each other. Now, excuse me. <clears throat> right. In 1988, after the return, return from USA, I was approached by uh, Dr. V.K. Atre, who later on became the chief of DRDO. Work on, sorry. I was approached by Dr. Atre to work on acoustic propagation across lined house. This was an entirely new field, but when I took the challenge, and eventually developed guidelines for design of the stealth linings for submarines. You know, this I want to tell you here, see, uh, those of you who are not very familiar with what happens in the uh, marine uh, warfare, uh, underwater, you know, the light cannot travel. Electro the electromagnetic waves also cannot travel. Only thing that can travel is you know, acoustic waves, because they make use of only the inertia of water and the, uh, I mean, the bulk modulus. So therefore, you know, it was uh, very important that we understood what was going on. So the enemy sends out a signal to their sonar, okay? And then from the reflect, after getting the reflection from our submarine, they will come to know where our submarine is and also whether it's moving and if it's moving in what direction or at what speed. And then using all the data uh, and basically uh, uh, signal processing, they are able to fire a torpedo at our submarine and destroy it. So our idea was that if you could develop linings uh, which simply absorb the signal that comes from the enemy, and nothing goes back. And when nothing goes back, they don't think our submarine is there at all. So we are able to make our submarine uh, invisible, as it were. Okay, but in this whole process, in fact, there was an element of serendipity. So I hope you understand uh, serendipity. Serendipity means basically when you are trying to do something and you are looking for some result, uh, you get entirely different result, which was not foreseen at all. Okay, but that is the way nature tries to tell us that what we are expecting is wrong. And that this whole phenomenon is called serendipity. Okay, so there was, in fact, when I was working on that, there were several times when we were we got results that were different, entirely different from what we were expecting. Okay, and but then you know, as they say, serendipity has never happened to an uninitiated person. Okay, so there is uh, some kind of uh, uh, natural phenomenon. And that governs this. Anyway, I mean, let me not go into the serendipity. But all I want to tell you here is about serendipity, uh, that it has been shown in the world more than 50% of discoveries that have happened, they have happened by serendipity. And a scientist was doing something, and he was expecting something, but something else happened. And instead of throwing it out simply, he tried to find out what had happened. And then he found that his expectation was wrong. And what had really, what was really happening is something different. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is, it took us many years uh, working on this problem. It was very challenging for me because I had to understand what is uh, underwater acoustics, and then also what is under warfare, and how, what we could also do, and then develop complete theory, acoustic theory, and develop acoustic linings that could absorb the signal that is coming. And the graphical user interface, as well as the codes for analysis of these resonator linings, were passed on to the design directorate of the Indian Navy. And this 
and some other associated pieces of research. Got me the coveted DRDO Academic Excellence Award for the year 2009 at the hands of the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh. But please note here that it's not just challenging and taking up a challenge, but also uh, perseverance. To get an idea of perseverance, look here. It started in 1988 and finished somewhere in 2007 or 8. It's almost 20 years. During these 20 years, uh, in fact, we published several papers on this, and uh, two students got their PhD on this particular subject. And therefore, what I want to tell you is that, in the, uh, you know, in research, uh, not only you need to challenge yourself and you know equip yourself with the necessary knowledge, but also you have to persevere. So my third sabbatical was at the Climate Control Division of the Ford Motor Company in Michigan. Now there, I was asked to work on, the, again in new field, vibroacoustics of hoses and pillows. Again, on which, about which I knew nothing. But again, I took up the challenge and uh, eventually I was able to, uh, you know, really do, do some very original work and publish a couple of papers in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. Now, these studies revealed that apart from their role in vibration isolation and the spectral bone sound, hoses and bellows play a considerable role in the breakout noise as well as enhanced actual transmission lines. Now, during all this time, you know, I was chairman of the National Committee for Noise Pollution Control which advises the Central Pollution Control Board, which is the executive wing of the Ministry of Environmental Forests. In fact, this uh, committee was set up in 1998, and I, I remained its chairman for 18 years. Okay, since its inception in 88, based on this committee's recommendations, the Ministry of Environmental Forests issued gazette notifications for the control of noise from diesel generator sets, uh, portable gensets, automobiles, firecrackers, public address systems, etc. And my sustained contribution to the noise pollution control uh, was recognized by the government of Madhya Pradesh to confirm for the Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru National Award in Engineering and Technology for the year 2010. So you can see here that. I must have been also uh, particularly lucky because everything that I did was recognized. You know, not, not everything happens like this. There are so many scientists in the, in the country uh, could be you know, as deserving as myself, uh, but not everybody gets that. And I got it simply, in fact, without trying. I just kept working and other things kept happening. You know, it's, it's really, people say you know, often, you know, how do you plan, how did you do this? I, was, I never planned for awards or distinctions, this, but those things happened automatically. Now, I uh, superannuated in July 2010. That was about uh, 11 years ago. Now, subsequent to my formal superannuation in July 2010, uh, I was offered this honorary professorship at Institute of Science for five years. Now, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, when I won't get uh, any uh, money, I would get, uh, you know, continued expenses to work. And not only that, uh, being honorary person meant that I could retain my office, my laboratories, my students, everything will continue as if I had not retired, except that I will not get any salary other than pension. But concurrently, during 2010 to 13, I the honor to work as INA uh, distinguished professor, and this one, of course, gave me extra money too. Now, during this time, I wrote two books: uh, Noise and Vibration Control. It's a textbook uh, for undergraduates and also for uh, people working in industry. 
And then second thing, of course, that was my, my research, acoustics of drops and mufflers, uh, second edition. And incidentally, uh, both these books uh, were sponsored by government of India. So I didn't have to spend any money on it. In fact, uh, you know, after that, whatever royalty I got, that, that of course I got keep. So that government of India has been very kind. Uh, they enable you to write these books at the same time, they don't uh, uh, ask any royalty out of it. And then I also, after these three years of INA Distinguished Professorship, I got INSA Senior Scientist from for three years, 13 to 16 and 17 to 19. And this again gave me some money too. Now, since 2019, I have been working as an INSA Honorary Scientist. And of course, recently, as you know, I got this AICT Distinguished Peer Professorship under which this, I'm giving this lecture to you today and sharing my life experiences. Now, post-retirement, I mean, I, as I said, I continue to work. So I've been working and guiding graduate students in analysis and design of multiply connected mufflers. It is a very challenging field again. Okay, these mufflers are used extensively in automotive exhaust systems that call for wide band insertion loss, particularly at and around the firing frequency and low back pressure. And multiply connected mufflers satisfy both the requirements that pose formidable challenge in modeling. And we have developed a novel integrated transfer matrix method for this type of mufflers, uh, which is quite a breakthrough. Incidentally, this we developed in around, around four years after retirement. A, a girl, you know, uh, she was uh, working with me for her MSc engineering. And, uh, you know, she was able to develop this. In fact, as I was telling you, I have been very uh, lucky to get some very good students. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, this girl uh, did not continue her PhD. You know, that's one of the problems in India still. Uh, where parents think that uh, a girl, you know, getting married at the right time is very important. Okay, so she was snatched away from the of science, and now she has been, of course, working at uh, BHL Hyderabad. Okay, but uh, I really feel that this loss was great because the kind of work she had done, she would have got nice PhD and a very good career. Even now she is working in research, uh, but then naturally again at such a different level. Now the latest development has been the design of double-tuned extended tube chamber mufflers, which are characterized by wide band transmission loss as well as low back pressure. Now this is a quite a big group uh, on which I have been working for the last four or five years. And I'm, pre I'm pre presenting, a, giving a keynote address next month, you know, in the, what is called SEAT, uh, Symposium on International Automotive Technology in Pune. At the Automotive Research Station of India. And also to avoid the rather cumbersome computational fluid dynamics modeling, a lumped flow resistance network model has been developed by us for evaluation of the mean flow back pressure, making use of the nonlinear electrical circuit theory. So, this is another thing. So, what I'm trying to say is uh, all this, what I'm saying here, uh, has been done after my retirement. In fact, I must say, you know, some of the best research from the practical point of view has been done only after my retirement. I'd also like to share with you some international honors that I got. And based on my sustained work in muffler acoustics, uh, I was invited to deliver a plenary address at the 18th International Congress on Sonar Vibration at Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And during the inauguration ceremony, I was bestowed with honorary fellowship of the International Institute of Acoustics and Vibration. Besides, I have been distinguished international member of the Institute of Noise Control Engineering of USA since 1988, member of the European Academy of Sciences, and member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Acoustics and Vibration until last year. And I wanted to share with you a little about uh, consultancy. It's more challenging 
Yet it is more satisfying for an engineering scientist at the end of the day. I have carried out more than 125 consultancy projects during the last five decades, apart from helping DRDO and the Defense Forces. In fact, I was a member of the Technology Advisory Board of uh, Indian Army, and I was also a member of the Technology Advisory Board for uh, the Council of Scientific Industry itself. Then working in the institutional consultancy mode, I have been able to earn for our return. I'm sorry. Our return to the Institute, substantial part of my salary or pension, apart from increasing my take-home salary or pension. Moreover, my students get the opportunity to work on real life problems. Consequently, they are in high demand from the industry. In fact, often, you know, when the campus uh, interviews took place, my students were one of the first to be picked up by industry, but this noise control field is one in which there are very few people in the country, whereas every industry has noise, noise problem. And then I just want to tell you a little about this textbook that I wrote on noise and vibration control. It's a textbook for undergraduates in mechanical engineering and published by World Scientific Public Publishers in Singapore in collaboration with ASC Press in June 2013. And it is based on my four decades experience in teaching and industrial consultancy. It is specially suited for self-reading by engineers working in industrial large control. Uh, in fact, several faculty development courses have been arranged are training teachers of engineering colleges who will then be encouraged to introduce this course in the undergraduate curriculum. You know, incidentally, you know, I uh, gave this one first course in Bangalore. We have 55 teachers and, and engineers attended this course. And then second was in IIT Bhubaneswar East, then third at uh, IIT uh, um, uh, Guwahati, and then also at uh, IIT um, Hyderabad, and, and that has that was uh, given by my former student who is now associate professor in Department Mechanical Engineering at the University of uh, I mean IIT Hyderabad. And also, uh, I also gave this uh, course and also this lecture at the College of Engineering Pune. Uh, I don't know whether uh, you know the connection that I'm trying to tell you. Uh, the present chairman of All India Council for Technical Education. You know, he was my PhD student in the 80s. Okay, and after uh, uh, working with me and got getting degree, uh, he uh, wanted to work, uh, you know, for the Northeast, which was uh, completely backward. And he got assistant professorship at, uh, uh, at Near East. Near East means Northeast Regional Institute of Science and Technology. And in fact, he set up the Department of Mechanical Engineering there. Later, uh, he was the one of the founders of IIT Guwahati. Uh, starting with associate professorship, he rose to become later uh, deputy director of uh, you know uh, IIT Guwahati. And then he was to revive College of Engineering in Pune, which is otherwise a 150 year old college, which was like a sleeping institute. And he came there, and now he. In nine years there, he really brought it to a level where it is supposed to be an ideal institution in Maharashtra. And it is from there that he was picked up to be chairman of All India Council for Technical Education. So I'm really, really proud of such uh, students. As I said, I'm, I've been lucky to have students like that. Now I want to tell you here that I have been able to attract uh, some very good students for PhD MSc and their creativity uh, has often surprised me. In fact, many times a student would come to me uh, with something which I really would not understand. That, uh, and there are two or three students, including uh, this Dr. Sansar Bhutte himself, you know, who did something which I, you know, I really actually could not understand first. So what I'm trying to say is that the main thing that is I want to share with you that this is what is called principle of mastermind. And a number of people uh, work on the same problem or think about the same problem together. 
in complete harmony. Often they come out with something which none of them individually would have thought of. And that's what is called the, you know, the principle of mastermind. And finally now, I would like to uh, uh, close this lecture with uh, some suggestions for the budding researchers. Rising out of all these personal experiences, there are a few suggestions that I would like to make to the younger members of the scientific and academic fraternity. First is be resourceful. It's very important, I repeat, be resourceful. The best of science was not created by scientists with great resources. In fact, all over the world, it's, uh, you, it, it, you can see that people had hardly resources, and, but that is what brought the best in them. In fact, I often turned the lack of resources into a challenge, and the result was amazing. That's what I told you in the last few slides. If you enjoy your work, you will never feel tired. I proved this to myself again and again in my life. In fact, let, let me tell you something interesting. Uh, when I became uh, chairman of the Division of Mechanical Sciences at IASC, uh, I was looking after 10 departments at the same time. By the end of the day, you know, I, I used to uh, feel kind, some kind of heavy headedness kind of thing, a, a small headache. And I had never had that kind of headache earlier. And so I talked to my uh, farmer guide as a nurseyman, and uh, he said, uh, knowing you, you are getting this headache because you are missing your research. You know, first I, I thought he was joking, but then he meant it. And then when I thought about it, I, I really realized that whenever I'm doing research, whosoever, how many hours I'm working, how much, you know, I never get any headache, never get tired. And here, because I was doing most of the time administration, and I was only dealing with human beings rather than real research. So what I did was, you know, I could not reduce that, but I, I started, I changed my routine, and I would go to the department in the morning at by eight o'clock, and then eight to 10 or 11, you know, I'd be doing my research or guiding students. And then, Again, the evening after coming back at four, five o'clock, again, go back to the department many times and do research. And when I started doing that, you would think that I would be getting more headache because now I was overworking. It's just opposite. I had no headache at all. So that satisfaction that is required, it was there. And I was very, very happy. And when you are happy, you cannot have headache at the same time. What I'm trying to say is that try to enjoy your work and that's what most important. Again, I say, enjoy the process of research. Do not make it a job. Work does not kill. Stress does. So don't be stressful. Enjoy the process of research and you'll see the results. Another thing I want to tell you is very, uh, on a serious note, creativity increases as we think deeper and deeper. And this depth, can be achieved by thinking about a problem undisturbed for long hours at a stretch without any coffee breaks or phone calls or chats. Now, incidentally, this is uh, what I did, uh, you know, during after my ME when I did was doing research. I was also a lecturer, but all the time I was in the library and doing this. And in the process, I was able to. In, that's how I was able to do. Uh, develop that algorithm and further, you know, get my PhD, etc. So what I'm trying to say is, and in fact, you know, uh, this is only a I mean, hint I'm giving you today. Uh, you know, this is what is the uh, subject matter of my second uh, lecture. Second lecture will be on towards creative, uh, I mean, creative thinking. I'm sure uh, Dr. Deepa Jose will make arrangement for it for my next lecture. But this is, I'll, I'll really go deeper into this about creative thinking and tell you that it's all in your hand and you can make any, you and your colleagues creative by this process and enjoy the whole process of research. Another thing I want to tell you is in the long run, 
clarity about basic principles, laws, and concepts is more important than cramming for the examination. Concepts remain with you for a long time, and during spells of deep extended thinking, they result in creativity. Again, as I said, I'll talk uh, at length in my second lecture, and I'll close it today, and thank you very much for your patient hearing. So uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was a very uh, good speech and uh, thank you so much for sharing your life experience and uh, how you work towards building the self-confidence by converting the negatives into positives. And uh, also, uh, I hope the student fraternity has gained a lot of inputs from you and uh, how to concentrate on basics and how to, uh, you know, uh, give more importance to learning the concepts and basics rather than just scoring marks for the exams. Thank you once again, sir, on behalf of the management of KCG College of Technology and on behalf of the students who participated today, a very heartfelt thanks to you, sir. Now over to you students, if you want to interact and ask doubts, any one of you want to ask doubts and clarify, you can go ahead, unmute yourself and start. Sir? Yes. Sir, how to stop overdoting on our confidence, sir? Uh, on our, sir. Uh, Can you repeat the question once again? How to stop overdoting on our uh, confidence level? Yeah. Let me just tell you here. Uh, you need to review your life and Try to put down on paper all the, all the situations in which you have succeeded, all your success stories, you know, put them on paper. Whatever small, small things right from childhood, you know, whatever you did and you succeeded, you know, put that down. So what happens is when you do all this, you will find that any time you feel diffident, all you need to do is read that again. And this is very important because what happens is, uh, you know, we, we tend to be very anxious about the results and all that. And we saw, how can I do it? How can I do that? How, how will I do it? No, never do this kind of negative thinking. Whenever you tend to do that negative thinking or doubt, self-doubting, you please go back to the page, that, uh, those page or pages. Read that when you have succeeded. And you will find that you will get out of the depression and you're ready to try again. Another thing is very important. You know, I'll give you the example of uh, somebody climbing, uh, doing mountain climbing. He may be, you know, uh, aiming at Mount Everest. But then as he's going along, he'll have so many, uh, you know, uh, instances where he'll feel very tired, very diffident. Or he'll, he'll look at the mountain above and says, my God, how can I climb that mountain? At that stage, all he has to do is he should look down. He's got to up, look down, and then see, look at all those mountains that he has already climbed to come to that point. You understand what I'm saying? He has to look down and then appreciate and congratulate himself that he could climb all this and then reach that particular stage. This is the way to get out of depression and get back your confidence. And once you get that confidence, start climbing again. Okay. And then let me also tell you, often we have this problem at industrial science quite a bit. Because what happens in the research, the real good results come only once in a while. And the question is, how do you keep yourself going during the rest of the time? And during the rest of the time, you have to learn to look Look down, that is all that things you have already achieved. In fact, I tell my students here at IASC, I said, whenever you feel depressed, tell yourself that you are at the Institute of Science. That means already you have already climbed so much, reached this stage. You are already you know, in, the, in the top one percentile of the students. So congratulate yourself being being better than 99% of the students. And then you will find that you don't feel indifferent anymore. 
to take the location. I hope I, I have answered that your, your question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, there is a question in the chat box, sir. Can I read it out? Yes, please. Uh, this is by a student, Karthik. Uh, he is asking you, uh, sir, have you ever failed any challenge that you have taken? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Nathan, I have given you only the, uh, how should I say, success stories. Okay, but I have, of course. But then whenever, uh, you know, I failed, you know, I, I this, is, this is how I put myself back. You know, but I had always... You know, in fact, I, I'll tell you something. Uh, 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 there is a book, you know, The Law of Success uh, by Napoleon Hill. I don't know when, if anybody knows about it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and I was, uh, you know, in the eighth standard, you know, and uh, the results were out and I got this uh, open scholarship, etc., etc. Uh, the, the, in a ceremony, the principal of the school he presented me some books. And one book was this one, that is The Law of Success. And in that Law of Success, there are several things. And uh, uh, this is how, you know, I mean, um, the best way is that you write down all your, uh, you know, what uh, you have succeeded in, so that whenever you get into that mode, you have to read that. So whenever I, I, I would, like I would have failed in something, I would refuse to accept the failure. Now, this is very important. Many people, they do much more harm to themselves by accepting a failure. Not accept it. All it means is that if I was trying a particular approach for something, that did not work. So that itself was a result. As it happens often in research, you know, that let us say a student comes to me and then, you know, I, I tell him, you know, to try, let us say, um, approaches A, B, and C, okay? Now, the approach A fails. When it fails, then I tell him that it's not that you have failed. I tell my student, yes, it's not that you have failed. It only means approach, that's all, okay? And that's the result. So that now onwards, I will also never tell any other student to apply that approach A. It does not work. So what I'm trying to say is, from any failure, uh, you have learned something positive and simply go forward. Okay? This is what I'll say, that not everything will succeed. Uh, but I, I can also tell you uh, that, uh, I mean, at least 70, 75% of the times I have succeeded. And all because of that one advice that I got from that uh, at the time in primary school. When I was told that you know, the, it all depends on how much you challenge yourself. And when I challenge myself, you know, whenever I have succeeded, I, have, I note it down. So all those notes are always with me to tell me that I am capable of doing this, capable of doing this. So therefore, I just don't let myself be discouraged. And another thing is very important I would like to share with you. See, when whenever you have a situation, uh, now, there are two ways of looking at this. One is that if nobody could solve this problem, how, how can I solve it? That's what 99% uh, of people do. How, you know, if nobody else could solve it, how, could I, how can I solve? Now, there's another way of asking is, if anybody will be able to solve this problem, why can it be me? You know? So what I'm trying to say is that even that same thing happened, you know, after my master's degree, uh, when I started working PhD instead of going abroad. And then, uh, you know, uh, I, I told myself that, you know, see, people, uh, you know, they, they are generally proud of saying, I worked at MIT. I worked under such and such professor. But why, why should it turn the other way around? That I, I raised myself to a level my teacher says that this Manohar Munjal was my student. I'll make him proud of me. I may I make institute proud of me, other than only using the institute name to go up. What I'm trying to say is, it's all a question of uh, your perception. 
and you should have the right perception and then only you can only go forward have i answered the question thank you sir i hope kartik uh... anyone else any other answer any other questions to ask good morning sir i have a question yes please yes sir uh, so my question is like how will we keep our focus on uh, on developing our intentions of building and developing our confidence on daily basis yeah that is very very important i'm glad you asked that question uh, again you know uh, i mean i lay my stress on writing let me first go back to the problem and i was telling you that you know i was working for several hours thinking about problem and actually my like anybody else my mind also would go you know everywhere else okay but then to see that does not happen i had made a habit whenever i am not finding uh, answer i ask myself okay what was the question it's very important we must ask learn to go back to the question So when I'm thinking about a question, I write it down on a paper. And and when I'm thinking, whatever occurs to me, I I just jot it down. After let us say two hours, I go back, and seventy to eighty percent will be almost silly what I what I had written. But there'll be one or two or three things which will say yes. I I think that makes some sense. You know, they take it forward, and that's what I do. So I cross out the other one and continue with that. Again, whatever occurs to me, I keep writing. All the all that time, by writing down and reading what I have written, automatically I preclude all extraneous thoughts. Because you know, mind has to think, and I'm giving a mind material to think on, rather than going randomly anywhere else. the same thing happens in the general questions in life you know that if you put down your aims and mind you another thing i want to tell you here uh, that your aims must be realistic and they should be well defined now let, let me let me explain to you if somebody says my aim is to get shanti swarup dragar prize no that is nonsense because there is no road going to that place so you have to ask yourself put question i mean achievables that are really achievable okay and then when you are doing that awards and distinctions recognitions they will come but you cannot plan for it most of the people only start planning for that and then because of that that whole thing is such that there is no such particular path going to that you never reach that so please don't do that you understand so you you can only say to yourself that no i have to understand this i must be able to do this this that i can do, do better than this this is not the right derivation you know i can do better than that so what i'm saying have challenges of a small small kind day to day and not straight away something of somebody for example is is starting to uh, you know climb mountain straight away cannot go uh, i have to go to mount everest that's nonsense you know so he has to say okay this is the hill i, I this is the path general path i must go uh, reach the reach the end i mean top of the hill to the end of the day so that is achievable okay so always have take that overall journey into small small journey and put them down on paper keep looking at them and day to day keep the go on thinking them okay and all the time remain with your aims and then you will find that one day you will be able to fulfill those aims okay have i answered the question yes sir thank you sir uh nitya you have any any more questions uh yes ma'am uh, i have a third one question Okay, please like, 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, sir, my question is like, uh, we tend to compare ourselves with other uh, people. So, is that a reason for lack of self confidence, sir? Yes. Never do that. Raise yourself to a level that others compare them with you. You don't do that. Please, in fact, when you compare, automatically you are accepting a lower position for yourself. Don't do that. You know, everybody is different. Everybody is unique. And so are you. You are unique. You may not have, let's say, 10 talents that I have, but you will have an 11th one which I don't have. Look for that 11th one. Look for your, you know, talents. And again, put it down on paper. And you know, all the time I'm telling you, putting down on paper. Because this is very important because we, in the, you know, we tend to forget good things or uh, right things. So if you have written down, it will always remain with you. So whenever you have reached those kind of sort uh, situations, all you have to do is close everything else, open up that pad, and start looking at it. Okay. So this is how you retain your, uh, you know, self confidence. Uh, thank you, students. Anyone thank else? You. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, before I starting anything or uh, doing anything, I just thinking that uh, what if I failed in this? So how to stop all that? Never, never, never do that. In fact, you are killing you are killing your thing right in the beginning. This what if is the worst thing that you can do. Never do that. What if this happens? What if this? Let it happen. Then it has happened. Let it happen. But don't ask this question. Such a a negative question to yourself. Please don't do that. Don't do that. This is how many people almost become their own enemies. In fact, you know, anyway, next time at the second lecture, uh, I'll be going deeper into many of these things about creativity. So, you know, keep, keep that, uh, you know, keep other, other questions for that, that day. So there's a technical question in the chat box. Can I ask yes. that to you, sir? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to do this is I would like to do spacecraft designing. Uh, so whether I should pursue BE in a mechanical or aerospace? The question posed by the student. For aircraft engineering, is it? For spacecraft designing. Spacecraft. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Please listen. Uh, remember one thing: uh, spacecraft designing or space science is a very, very multidisciplinary science. You will find, if you, if you look at ISRO, for example, today, uh, more than 50% are mechanical engineers. Almost 30, 35% are basically in the controls. Controls, uh, you know, and guidance. That is all, basically they are electrical communication engineers or electrical engineers. Uh, also, you know, the in mechatronics and so on. Okay, and then there are people also from a chemical engineering side uh, because they work on basically the fuels uh, for rockets, etc. Okay, and because everything is finally fluid mechanics also, so you need to learn that. So there's nothing like, I mean, space science is not by itself a single discipline. Uh, to give you uh, one good example, uh, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Suresh who was earlier director of uh, the VSSC Trivandrum. Uh, he has written a book on uh, space science. That, that's the first book of its kind in the world, where he has really covered all what he did or he learned over the years. But basically, he's like me, a mechanical engineer from IIT Madras. So what I'm trying to say is that you know. So there's nothing like, uh, you know, what you should be doing to do that. But all me, you have to only start your career only in small basic thing like either mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, electrical communication engineering, et cetera. But later on, you know, you join uh, Trivendram, you know, Indian Institute of Space Technology. I hope you have learned about this institute. So they, they, they give you the MTech degree in that, and then they train you in all the aspect of space science. So, and they take, I mean, intake is from mechanical, electrical, electronics, and, uh, you know, uh, electrical communications. 
Thank you, sir. Anyone sir? else? Yes, yes. Lokesh, please. How do I bounce back from rejection and failures? <laughs> I wish I were a counselor. <laughs> but the main thing is that, you know, I mean, you, you try to change the way you think. Do not, uh, you know, uh, nurture any negative or defeatist kind of uh, thinking. Don't do that. That's why I said, you know, I mean, about anything particular, instead of asking you, saying, if nobody has been able to solve this problem, how can I solve? Instead of that, say, if anybody can will be able to solve this problem, why could it be not me? What I'm trying to say is you expect from yourself much more. And you will find that you may not get all that, but you will definitely get something out of that. And this is what I have been doing. You, you look at me, for example, now. I told you that, uh, I mean, we started completely from penniless position from a refugee camp, no guidance at all. And my father or mother, they were also illiterate. Now, if I had done that thinking, oh my God, what future I have, I should I should only pick up something from the market and start doing that. But, uh, no, I don't do that. I mean, just, I, I went to school and that, I was, was telling you about that uh, lecture on that, you know, development of the brain. Now, after all that sentence was heard by hundreds of students, but I must have been one of the very few who really, Got it because I was all the time I was looking for an answer to how do I guide myself in life. And here was something he told me that it's all in your hand. And I used it and I have been so successful in my life, just picking up from that one advice I got from that psychologist. So what I'm trying to say is all the time you have to do only positive thinking. The negative thoughts should not be uh, nurtured or nursed at all any time. I am telling you this works. This really works. And not, not, don't ever ask this question or start this, but if this happens, please don't do that. Then you are your worst enemy. This question is not to be asked. Please. Sir, thank you, sir. Very inspiring, sir. And hope and wish that the students are equally inspired by you. Uh, over to student Doreen to wind up the session. Any other questions? I hope uh, sir has answered more they than can, six questions. They can and I the thank question. the student. <laughs> yes, sir. They can keep the questions for the next lecture. Yes. Yeah. I thank the students for being interactive and asking so many doubts and for uh, attending for more than one and a half years. Uh, Hours. Uh, very thankful to the students and for showing the interest to participate in the session also. Over to Doreen, student of Electronics and Communication Engineering to wind up the session. I'm sure, sir, that your words from your experience are going to help us mold our lives more constructively. Uh, hope we will put all into practice the lessons from this session for a future filled with hope and promise. Thank you, sir, for your valuable insights. Perception creates reality. You can become the person you want to be. You have heard it said that if you can believe it, you can achieve it. So start believing in yourself. Act on that belief and you will start building self-confidence in your life on your way to success. What an eventful session it has been. I would like to invite Dr. Deepa Jose to deliver the vote of thanks. So, uh, as I told already, uh, from the on behalf of the management and the students, I extend my heartfelt thanks and invite you to the next session. Hopefully, we'll plan it uh, during the month of uh, September or October, according to your convenience. Thank you once again.